Thanks so much. Thanks for organizing and for, for hosting and everything else that's been put into this day. It's a lot of work to organize a conference, so thank you, Jean, and everyone else. Um, so the title of the talk that I was given is What Can Americans Do um, to Help Prevent Nuclear War and Achieve the End of Nuclear Weapons? And um, I'm a little uncomfortable with this title because I'm not actually a US citizen. <laughs> Uh, so here I am, Irish Canadian, wandering in, telling you what to do. Um, so instead of telling you what to do, I'm going to talk about what other people are doing um, here in the US, but also abroad around the world. And hopefully this will provide some inspiration for the activism that will come out of today's conference and that will consume you for the rest of your life, um, as it does for all of us. And it's, uh, this is the first time I've ever had to follow Vincent, so now I feel super intimidated. But I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to do my best. Um, so I think, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about the Nuclear Ban Treaty. You've heard, you've heard about it a few times today already. Uh, Vincent just mentioned it. Ira and Daryl both mentioned it this morning as well. Um, it may have come up in your workshops, too. Um, and I think the thing I want to focus on is a little bit of why we pursued a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons without the nuclear armed states because it's a big question for people, and Vincent framed it very well of um, it being the majority of countries in the world, uh, non-white countries, countries of the global south that really led in this process. Um, the nuclear armed states all boycotted this process. They also, the US also through pressure, got its Western European and Eastern European allies to boycott this process by instructing its counterparts in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to stay away. So the Western world largely did not participate in banning nuclear weapons, and in fact put a lot of pressure onto the rest of the world not to do it. And we were in a very interesting situation throughout this process, um, which sort of took place over the last 10 years, roughly, to build up to the actual ban treaty being negotiated and adopted last year. Um, but what was really interesting about, about this is that at the one side, nuclear armed states are telling us, this treaty is going to be useless, we're staying away from it, it's not going to affect our weapons. And on the other side, they're freaking out about it. They're putting all of their colonial uh, power tactics at play. So we had, like, France, um, threatening Francophone African countries, former colonies, uh, with economic and military aid restrictions if they support this treaty. Um, we had the UK doing the same thing to some of its former colonies. And the US was just threatening everybody because that's what the US does. So it was, there was a lot of pressure that was come to bear on these countries to not negotiate a treaty banning nuclear weapons. Um, so we knew that it wasn't going to be useless. And one of the main things that we looked at when we were coming up with a formulation for this treaty and why we wanted to pursue this even without their support, when the rhetoric for so long had been that you have to engage the nuclear armed states, you can't do anything without them, it's not possible to make progress until they have the political will themselves to do something about this, we looked at how other countries have dealt with and how other civil society activist movements have dealt with these arguments around different, uh, different policy questions throughout history. So in the sphere of disarmament, we have two recent treaties, the Landmine and Cluster Bomb Treaties, but we also have every social movement that has ever taken place in the world. Every question um, like Vincent just said, every question, every issue that has ever changed, every bit of social justice we have managed to achieve in this country and in other countries has come from the pressure of people. And it has come from this process of stigmatizing certain types of behavior, of changing norms around what is acceptable, about changing the dialogue and the discourse around people, around politics, and forcing these changes collectively and shifting where we're at as society. And so this is something that the anti-nuclear movement has tried to do throughout history and has succeeded in very different ways um, around in the 1980s. There was the movement in uh, Central Park with a million people. In the 1960s, there was the pressure to get the test ban treaty, the collection of baby teeth, all kinds of social justice activism was going on, different communities engaged 
from all kinds of different angles on this question. And since the end of the Cold War, the issue of nuclear weapons has not been on the public's radar. It's turned into more of a techno-strategic question, centralized in Washington, D.C. If you're not an expert, you're not really participating. We have all kinds of other social justice issues and planetary crisis issues to contend with. And so how to make nuclear weapons relevant again and how to build on the shifts that have occurred in the past that have stigmatized nuclear weapons and turn this into something legally binding that the world's governments are also willing to get behind. Um, so a million people in Central Park in the 1980s, 122 governments in the United Nations just last year supporting the same goals, the complete abolition of nuclear weapons. And changing the conversation is a huge part of this. So on the nuclear ban process, we looked at the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. Instead of these conversations about deterrence and how we need nuclear weapons for security and what numbers of nuclear weapons will keep us safe and all of this stuff that has kept this discourse in a phase where nuclear weapons are seen as logical and justified in the right hands, the right hands being extremely racist as well, um, but instead looking at the humanitarian impacts, going back to the work of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, studies they had done in the 80s and updating those, looking at uh, new uh, figures, facts and figures related to what we know about climate change, what it means for food production, also listening directly to survivors and engaging, of course, as we always have, the survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also engaging with uh, First Nations folks in Australia that experienced British nuclear testing, or uh, indigenous folks from across the Pacific that experienced French or US nuclear testing, um, survivors from Kazakhstan, and from even from the United States and Nevada. So talking to different communities and bringing their perspectives to the forefront not as a single testimony um, at, a, at a conference, but relying on their words and their calls and their definitions of security and their experiences to guide our work. Listening also to the women that were leading in the movement, the queer folks leading in the movement, uh, folks from the global south, people of color, making sure that their security interests and their definitions of security were really impacting our conversation. And that's again about what changing conversation requires, is listening to everybody and elevating people's voices who traditionally don't get heard in the anti-nuclear weapons field or in the nuclear uh, techno-strategic field in Washington, DC. And making sure that we're constructing something together that works for everybody. So these were sort of the techniques and goals that ICANN tried to pursue in its development of a nuclear weapon ban treaty as a solution. Um, and we were able to bring along many governments with this process. Governments who, as Daryl said this morning, were very frustrated. They're looking at US modernization that we've talked about so much today. They're looking at the failures to comply with the non-proliferation treaty agreements. So they are frustrated, but they're also hopeful. They're hopeful because there's a campaign, a big civil society campaign that's global that wants to make change with them. They're hopeful because they were successful in banning cluster munitions and landmines, two weapons that the US, the Russians, the Chinese said could not be banned, that they were instrumental for their military strategies, uh, they were necessary in conflict, but then 20 years after landmines have been banned, 10 years after cluster munitions have been banned, what we're seeing is, is actually these weapons are stigmatized. And even the countries that haven't joined these treaties, like the US government, they're actually complying with these treaties to, to the, a majority extent. So the United States, for example, um, has stopped producing cluster munitions. Uh, the last company making these bombs in the United States stopped in 2016. Um, the US doesn't use landmines in conflict anymore. The only place that it's using them is the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. And Obama declared a policy of no more use of landmines. And we're seeing this from other countries as well that didn't support the treaty originally. Now they're donating money to landmine clearance. They're donating money to victim assistance. They're not using these weapons anymore. So we've seen over the last decades since these treaties uh, came into force how things have shifted. Is it perfect? Are all of these weapons eliminated? Are they never being used anywhere in the world? No, but things have changed significantly 
And this has been uh, a boon to survivors and to um, rehabilitation of land, reclaiming land for farming. Uh, and it's made a big difference in human lives. And so we have these examples to build off of, which is what the rest of the international community wanted to do with nuclear weapons, looking at what our power is without these weapons, looking at it from the perspective of activists or activist diplomats who don't want violence to be what dictates foreign policy, who don't believe that we need to threaten the planet or that we have the right to threaten the planet in order to determine our security. That security actually means something much bigger than one country, much bigger than the ideas that nuclear weapons provide some sort of strategic stability between global superpowers, but actually keen to build something together. So if this all sounds a little bit conceptual or meta to you, I wanna bring it back down to um, activism and organizing and share with you a little bit what, what I know that's going on and what um, you might be inspired by. And of course, others have talked about this already. Um, from Ira's presentation this morning, you got some examples of, of things to do. Um, around the world, I think one of the biggest campaigns right now coming out of uh, the treaty prohibition has been a divestment campaign as well. So how this worked with landmines and cluster bombs is that while they prohibited these weapons in international law, they also made sure that they had uh, very effective campaigns calling on banks and pension funds and financial institutions not to put money into producing these weapons anymore. They're illegal, they're outlawed, so you, why would you spend money making these weapons anymore? So we've taken the same approach with nuclear weapons and interestingly, actually, this was one of the other reasons we knew that a nuclear ban treaty would be a very useful tool, because before we had it, at the very beginning of ICANN about 10 years ago, we were calling around to uh, banks in different countries, Australia, Canada, asking banks that did have divestment from landmines, for example, or maybe that were starting to think about divestment from fossil fuels or or other things, we would ask them why they didn't have a divestment policy on nuclear weapons. And they told us, well, nuclear weapons aren't illegal, so we don't have a policy on divesting from them. But landmines, cluster bombs, those are illegal. Um, so making a treaty to prohibit them uh, was a good step towards uh, enhancing the divestment campaign. Um, we built up a resource called don'tbankonthebomb.com. It is global. Uh, it has all the companies that are involved in producing nuclear weapons, many of which, most of which, uh, are U.S. companies, uh, weapons manufacturers, and uh, those that are involved in running the nuclear weapon laboratories in this country. And it also has information on all of the banks that we use, all of the um, financial institutions that are putting money into these companies. So you can use this resource to figure out if your bank is investing, and you can call your bank, ask them to stop investing, tell them you'll take your money out and put it somewhere else if they don't have a policy on uh, divesting from nuclear weapons. This has worked. It is something that everybody can do. It has uh, had a huge impact in European banks already, um, even though European countries haven't yet supported the nuclear ban treaty except for a few uh, exceptions. Um, and we're seeing also pension funds in countries like Norway and the Netherlands, two countries that don't support the treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons yet, their government pension funds have been divested from nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons are illegal. Um, so this work can be done very locally. It can also be done at the city level. So in New York City, for example, um, some of the local ICANN campaigners are working to get this New York City Council to pull all of its money, its pension funds, its city level pension funds, so firefighters, cops, teachers, all of those pension funds to come out of nuclear weapons. New York City is also doing this on fossil fuels right now, so nuclear weapons will be the next step. So there's lots of different ways to engage at the city level in the divestment work at your local level, your personal level, with your friends, with your family, and to put pressure uh, on where the money is going, which is very important in this country, as we all know. Um, other city work that's going on, ICANN has a city appeal. And so cities around the world, Toronto, Melbourne, Sydney, also LA, have joined up to the city appeal, which basically says that the city supports the nuclear weapon ban treaty and wants the government to join. 
So we're seeing um, a bunch of cities in Europe about to come on board with this as well. So this is a growing thing. Um, and there's a lot more that can be done in that regard as well. Uh, there's also, of course, your state and federal uh, legislators. So ICANN has a parliamentary pledge, but we've changed it to a congressional pledge for the US. Um, so you can go to your representatives, get them to sign on. And again, it's a thing that commits them to working personally within their party, but also as individuals to promote the treaty and to change the government's position on the nuclear ban treaty and to work for nuclear disarmament in all the steps that Ira was speaking about this morning. So there's tools out there that we have um, that are really useful. And for those of you that also like doing more than asking people to sign things or asking banks to change things, there's also good old fashioned protest. Um, direct action is needed and it is vibrant and growing again in this country. I am so excited to see every day the protests around various issues in this country that are concerned with so many different social justice issues and nuclear weapons is right up in there. And this is a great opportunity to be networking with each other across student groups, across uh, different organizations, working on different issues. And really, again, as I was talking about earlier, building up this challenging narrative and having different perspectives in our work and making sure that our work is aligned with other people's work, supporting the overall project of social justice. Um, there's lots of different direct action groups you can join, um, but there's also you know, other groups that are doing different things that you can get involved in. Um, I know the plowshares activists in this country have historically been amazing. <laughs> um, yes, and yeah, yes, yes, facing trials and in prison and doing the good work and being relentless and um, spreading this, this word in communities that might not otherwise get reached. So that, there's that amazing work. Um, ICANN has a, a queer uh, group, International Queers Against Nukes. Um, we also have a direct action fund group you can join, which is the Treaty Enforcement Squad, which goes around to different nuclear sites and does little protests. Um, so you know, there's lots of things you can get involved in that exist, or you make your own. Um, and then I think at the end, the, the conversation is probably one of the most important things that we need to keep changing. And so that, you know, many of you know how to do this, op-eds, letters to the editor, um, meetings like this, conferences like this, um, bringing together people from different walks of life to talk about these issues and to do trainings, whether it's trainings for direct action, trainings for lobbying in Congress, uh, trainings to come to the UN and talk to diplomats. Um, there's all kinds of things we can do, and I think it's about building community, and it's about uh, having an intergenerational and intersectional approach to all of our work. And I guess I just want to end with uh, whatever you're doing or however you're approaching these issues, I think it's really important to stay hopeful because it is so easy to feel overwhelmed, um, especially when you listen to Ira, <laughs> um, and hear about uh, how we can die. Um, but, uh, sorry Ira, not to say that you're not hopeful, but um, I always feel a bit, ooh, uh, when I listen to him talk. Um, I think one of the important lessons that, that I've had to learn and that, that my mentors have, have really taught me over the years is that it's not, it's not about winning in an absolute sense, um, it's not about fixing everything all at once. It's really about disrupting things, challenging things, and keeping other people engaged and building something together as, as a community. And so I love coming to meetings like this and meeting new people or um, strategizing with old friends about how we can make things better and ch try something new. And that's how we came up with banning nuclear weapons. It's how we come up with anything. It's working <laughs> together, throwing ideas around, we were told that we were naive. We were told that we were crazy. I'm sure all of you have been told this. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It, you might as well just give up. You know, you're, you're one person or you're a small group or you've been doing this forever. Aren't you tired? You haven't won anything yet. But we do win. We win by showing up. We win by working together. We win by changing the narrative. We win by getting treaties. We might not have fixed everything, but we're making a dent. We're making the opposition's lives harder. We're making it harder for them to justify nuclear weapons. We're making it harder for them to use nuclear weapons. 
We're making it harder for them to pretend that they can control the narrative anymore, that they are the dominant ones in control anymore. A lot of the pushback that we got and have gotten is very patriarchal, very racist, and it's grounded in a reality that is controlled by a small number of people. But we are actually the majority, the people who don't want to see the planet destroyed, the people who do want to work together and build something better that works for everybody. Um, so I think there's a lot to have hope in and to keep each other going in this movement. Thank you. <laughs>